Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on movement and decision making. I've got a stellar cast with me today. My name's Matt Portis. I'm the physical performance education lead at the FA. And joining me for this webinar is Sean Reid from the Premier League, uh, Paul McGuinness, who is a, a FA coach developer, and Graham Carrick is a FA youth coach developer. Good afternoon, everyone. Afternoon. Afternoon. Hi, guys. In this session, um, we've got four overarching aims. Uh, we're going to talk about the importance of linking physical movement to decision making in football. We're going to look at um, observing players under the microscope, so trying to inform session and program design by really scrutinising the movement and the decisions that players have to make in different scenarios within the game and how that how we can help players get better at doing this regardless of um, the stage or age of development within the game we're going to give um, this topic real consideration from the four corners but specifically focusing in on technical and physical characteristics and we're also going to be making reference to how we might uh, integrate physical specialists into this coaching design and, and practice process so just to give some context really to the background of of why this is important um, we often see scenarios like this playing out in in the elite game in the in modern football where we will see really congested space mm. tight areas so and at the top end of the game players are having to make very fast decisions and on the back of that execute very quick intense high speed often high force movements in relation to their opponents trying to beat an opponent trying to find space and often this occurs in um the business ends of the field so in in, in as we as the as players approaching um our final third or if the ball's within our own third we'll often see this happening and it's not always with the numbers of players that we see in this image we also see uh situations playing out like this where in this area of the field we've got fewer players involved there's an overload in relation to one team but the team in possession are having to think about where does the pass go? What's the movement like? How do I how do I find space? The defending team are having to think about reacting to the movement of the players around them while maintaining the structure of the of the team shape and organization. So there's these kind of mini battles and, and small sided battles going on within the game all over the field. Guys, anything to add at this point? yeah i think i think matt really just it, it's football interactions are going on constantly as the ball moves a different picture happens so a different movement needs to react to it so it, it's constantly looking at the interactions between the player the players their teammates their opponents the ball and the conditions in the in the environment yeah the pitch all those things you're looking at Absolutely. And I think just to just to keep considering, it's about the the player on the ball, but it's also about the players off the ball. Yeah, uh, and preparing for preparing the picture or preparing for the ball to come, whether that's um, attacking wise or, or defensively. Yeah, and when your team's in and out of possession, of course. Yeah. And I think the other thing, just to add, which I'll obviously go on to in a bit, in a bit, a bit of time, is around the space in the various spaces in around the players, the open space and so forth, and just taking, uh, making sure players are aware of that and appreciation and actually how they use that and how they move in with and around that. Great. I think the point where we're getting to, this is just a, a, a small um, excerpt of a clip. What we're focusing in on here is um, Raheem Sterling's basically just won the, won the ball back off um, Trent Alexander-Arnold high up the field. There's some body contact as he's as he's won the ball. He then spins down the line and, and puts a cross into into the Liverpool penalty area. Um, 
And if we focus in a little bit more on this, within that part of the field when he wins the ball back, we might break the game down to say, well, there's actually a small 3v2 confrontation going on there. But zoom in even more, and we've got this, this 1v1 confrontation between Alexander-Arnold and Sterling. And I think the, the, the focus of, the, of a large part of what we're going to be talking about today is really zooming in and focusing in on the players on the ball, off the ball, and looking within these small aspects of the game, the smaller number aspects of the game and the 1v1s as well, what's going on in terms of what decisions might the player need to consider and then physically what might the characteristics need to be and what might he need in his toolbox um, to best equip him to be able to deal with uh, either being on the ball or off the ball in, in these um, high intensity but 1v1 duels. Would you would, would that resonate with everyone? Would you agree with that? No, definitely. I think I think um, what we're looking to to develop are players that can problem solve, that can adapt and adjust given the situation and the environment they're in. And that might be a 1v1, it might be an overload, it might be within a tight area, it might be within a big area. But to get from A to B, we've got, we've got to develop players that can overcome those problems uh, based on the information they take in and then actually physically moving themselves, whether it be with the ball or without the ball. Absolutely. And you referred to it um, a couple of slides ago, Reedy. Do you just want to take us through this, this idea about... Uh, that you're familiar with around the areas of space and, and how we might use this and the understanding of this to to kind of help us interrogate the game, interrogate player movement in a little bit more detail? Yeah, sure. So, so I suppose in some of the work that I've done in the past, um, along with a, a, a good colleague of mine, Mike Critchell, is, a, is around sort of focusing on four areas of space and how we, how we operate and move it within four areas of space. And that will very much link uh, what we perceive, what we decide, and actually what we do. Um, so if I break it in down to the four areas, you've got the general space, which could be the area that you're working with. It could be the whole pitch. It could be within the penalty area. It could be within a training area that you've set up. And it gives a reference point to those players to understand and identify where they are in relation to everything else, whether it be the ball, other spaces, other players, the goal, et cetera, et cetera. And then they start to recognise, and that will obviously impact uh, and heavily influence the way they move, when they move, and how they move. And then you've got another key area, which you can see down the bottom is, is within this 1v1 situation. Again, it doesn't have to just be within this, this area with the ball. It can happen all over the pitch. Is, um, is, is the player, in particular, in the ball is recognising where they can exploit the open space. And by open space, we're referring to space down the side, around the back, or uh, in front, across the front of the player. Um, and in this position is trying to exploit and utilize it. And again, that how we utilize that space will vary based on what we what we take in, what our experiences have been, and then obviously how we effectively move. So going from slow to quick or slow, quick to slow, et cetera. And again, that will happen with and without the ball. And the 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 other the other element to it within this is this closed space. This is a space we want to try and uh, avoid because someone else is in it and we want to try and get around it. So you almost like that dodging movement or it's a space that we want to invade. And again, depending on what we're trying to do in those, particular, in those two different situations will heavily impact on how we actually do it. So if we're trying to avoid it, it might, you might, it might be in essence, so you drop your shoulder and you accelerate away. If you're trying to invade it, that might be that acceleration to decelerate, to slow down, to then nullify the opposition you're up against. So in this situation, Sean, that means that Sterling, because he's in possession, he's trying to prevent alexander arnold entering his self space which would be the closed space for alexander arnold I'm yes guessing. so 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 in this one he's trying to avoid alexander so he's trying to get away from him that would be the closed space so he's trying to avoid whereas alexander's trying to invade on his you know, his space so that's a that closed space is one that he wants to invade on so again it's a great example of how you get two two ends of the spectrum mm -hmm. um and, and the most important one which i think um, is key for players, especially how they move and how they operate. And we and we see it within the, the top level players, your Messi, your Suarez, and people like that about they how they can operate in self space. And self space is the space that you operate in all the time. And that might just be from walking to running to 
to to having the ball in possession of you to jumping up in the air that 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 is a space that you control and how you manage it and it might even may might even entail you know holding the player off the ball and again managing that self space and we need players to be able to effectively move and control their own self space um again with with other things going on now what one thing to to be mindful of is that we have this internal and external zone of balance where an internal zone of balance is almost like your shoulder width where you feel comfortable and it's a good starting position. We recognize that sometimes you delve into that external zone of balance, but you've got to quickly move from there back into your, your internal so you can then still move around. Um, but often we get players that will find themselves getting caught in that external zone too much and therefore they're not able to make that second or third movement. So they're the sort of four key areas of space that yeah. we sort of look at and it does help shape how you work with people and also flashes the light on that part of the game that will help you um, help you prepare your players. And Sean, is that then you know a big part of of the game in sense of understanding your own capabilities in your space and trying to use that against your opponent so that you know it might be the very best players say Messi. He's enticing the players into his cell space. He's enticing them to come in there so that they will get overbalanced. And at that point, he uses the acceleration to speed away. So it's that cat and mouse, but really understanding the timing, isn't it, to try and get someone to commit. Yeah, a a absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And, and and again, each individual is very different. Uh, and then when we start to understand our own bodies and understand how we move, like Paul's just made the point there, is you can then start to sort of, I don't know, work out your opponent about how you can lose them or how you can drag them out and, and then get, get out from them or, or to, you know, to pull them in and then suddenly get past them. So there's, you know, there's a lot of that, absolutely, and we recognise that individuals do it in completely different ways, or very, sorry, not completely different ways, but in very different ways, and and the successful ones because they recognise their own strengths and weaknesses of how they can operate and how they can move. Yeah, I think from a, co a coaching point of view, it's really important that bearing that in mind that we do help the players explore their sort of boundaries themselves, um, and like how much space do they, do they actually need in that moment. Um, and that might be slightly different, I guess, for different players. And I think just linking back to the your, your, the points you made about internal and external balance, um, we talk a lot in coaching around before, during, after. And I'm guessing, say, in that instance there, how you approach the ball. So what you do before, say, as the defender getting towards the player on the ball, what you do in your approach and how you actually arrive into that moment where you're going to try to tackle or, or defend, as you're saying around that your state of balance will really affect the following actions, won't it? Because if you get yeah. out of balance at that point, then that kill that can potentially have a big knock-on effect on how you then deal with the, with, with the sort of second action. Is that right? Yeah, I would I would definitely say because if you think if, if you're going to go if you've got a, a, a fairly uh, you've got some distance to cover, so if we're saying five or ten yards, you've got to get up to the player. Your stride pattern will certainly change from obviously that initial starting point to that to that end point to make sure you're in a good position to then to then um, deal with the attacking player. And it's that control that you're going to require uh, to, to enable you're in a, an effective position. Then the, the attacking person will obviously make their decision and make their make their mixed movement. And you've got to be in a position where you can then st stay with them. And again, that's not just a physical thing. That's also reading the cues and the, and the cues and so forth. Um, and so that's integral because if you, if you then pick up the right cues, then that will then prepare your body for making that next type of movement. And I guess that's where the importance of deception and the cat and mouse stuff really comes in because you're Absolutely. trying to destabilize your opponent, aren't you, in, in that sense? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and and a lot of the work that, that I've done in the past, which I know a lot of coaches would have done, is around this mirroring work. Um, and I think that's that's a real important part, and uh, especially working, I guess, across the sort of three different planes of movement. But it's important because <clears throat> that whoever takes it, so if we, if we say the attacking player is in control and they, and they, drop, your, they drop the shoulder one way, the defending player will react to that, but then if the if the attacking player then goes the second another way, he's trying to reduce the difference between the first stimulus and the second stimulus, and and you and you need to continually continually practice that to enable the for for this example for the defending player to make sure that they're staying with that opponent through perception, and then obviously doing the physical element to it of moving their body to be able to um, to stay with the uh, the attacking player. That point about discovery, Graham, is a really important one when, we, when we're working with developing players, isn't it? So they might not always make the right decision based on their, their physical capabilities right now, but it's about working out what works and, 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 and experimenting with what works for the, 
for the, the the characteristics that you've got within your game in terms of your your technical ability, but also the physical qualities that you bring to those situations. And, and, and I guess, Matt, that's that's especially important as kids' bodies are changing or going through growth or any of that. So to then continue to sort of explore and search and figure out as their capabilities change and the body changes that they can sort of keep exploring that to find out where their limits lie and, and what fits for them within these like individual moments within the game. Absolutely. I, I think that's paramount. Why well, it's, it's paramount that we give kids a range of experiences to, to provide them with the armory they require so that, that, that when, when, you know, they're able to build on it and develop it so that when they are exposed to these situations, they would have, they'd be best placed to be able to deal with it um, as opposed to sort of um, almost restricting what they're able to do. Um, and again, there's a whole host of different activities that can be done in order to achieve that. And when you say, when you say kids as well, Reedy, obviously you've worked in both academies and at first team level as a fitness coach and as a as a technical coach. So it's you know this works right throughout the kind of age ranges, doesn't it? You know, people can learn and, and improve their perception and decision making and the movement related to that. Yeah, absolutely. And we recognise there's obviously opportunities throughout the player's pathway where you can sort of accelerate some of their learning. But I know from drawing upon my own experiences, one of the, the key times is you, you still keep working with players, but especially when players get injured and they're out for a long period of time, you've almost got to re-educate uh, and sort of re-educate that type of movement um, and, and, uh, and you know, continually develop and, 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 uh, and work on their perception decision-making just because they're, over six months of time, they're losing that. And then suddenly you're expecting them to come back into the game. You've got to make sure that you prepare them. And a lot of that will slow down. A lot of that will have um, have not been uh, or may, may not get worked on. And and then, you know, they're not, you're not giving them the best chance to sort of um, get back into the game. So it's in, it's imperative, yes, at very young ages, but also continue through the older age groups. Because I'm, I'm guessing as well, Sean, on that, um, a lot of this is heavily dependent on sort of the attunement of like this, this, the, the perception of how, how much are you picking up and noticing in the moment um, as you say, if you're not, if you don't, uh, when you come back from an injury, often it does take a bit of time. People talk about match fitness as like almost a phys physiological type thing, but I guess just getting your pictures and your eyes, getting your eye back in, is as yeah. important. Yeah, I think so. I mean, again, just just for part of my journey, it was one of the things we said was we we got to coach players back to fitness. We haven't got to just get them fit, where it's just purely a, a physical thing, because we know that you know if, if you're not picking up. If, if, if you, it's almost like if, you, if your brain stops working, I don't mean entirely, but just in terms of the, within these situations, things will become slow, you don't become attuned to it. So it's important that, that, that we still stimulate them because obviously we know that the movements are dependent on the information you take on, drawn upon experiences and then actually executing them. It's not just a movement in isolation. We don't move for, for no particular reason. We, we do it for because of a stimulus. Yeah, and, and Paul mentioned earlier about, you know, Messi uses it as a, a deliberate action. He entices players into his space and then jinks past them. And he does that because he's a he's an expert in terms of perception and action. And and, he, and he's also got the agility, you know, higher levels of agility than most other players in the world, and the power and speed to do it. So he he's enticing that because he's done it thousands of times, and it's effective because of the. The, the the skill that he has at moving the ball, but also moving his body, and he, and he's and he's and he's mastered that, hasn't he? So he's really really effective at doing that. Um, yeah, I think as well, Matt. It's important we you know we sort of dissecting everything in minute detail here, and for the people listening, that sometimes you need a reference point of your own. And if you go back to your own childhood and you were playing Wembley singles or Wembley doubles or when or, or you were playing British Bulldog in the park, a lot of these movements things we're talking about are just that you know the guy's trying to stop you in british bulldog you're going really fast one way you put the brakes on you actually go backwards and you see messi do that in the game go backwards you stick your chest your chest sticks out and you have to go back to because he's sticking his arm out you've moved your whole body and then you can go the other way so while we're talking a load of uh, stuff that we're sort of analyzing we mustn't get to the point of analyzing to paralyze people's brains it's it's very there is quite simple logic behind it all uh, if we if we if we're playing british bulldog and picture yourself doing that you know how quick do i have to go how close do i let him go before i stop 
I have to get him going fast before I stop and he flows past me one way and I go the other. There's all those sort of things that you can try and get into a, a basic idea of, you know, how do I beat that guy? Um, and you can try and relay that into, into different situations with a ball. You know, it's, um, it, it's, it, some of it is quite basic really, but we, we're trying to really get into the detail of it. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll turn, sorry, Graham. Uh, you go, Sean. I was just I was just gonna say it's interesting when you're working with obviously the, the, the younger the, the younger players is that you, the, the art of using imagery is so key because you can you know I know Paul's done some work with it in the past, but if you um um it, it, you can you can relate someone to say, Well, okay, I want you to move I want you to pretend you're let's say Cristiano Ronaldo or pretend you're this particular player, and then as long as the players recognise who they are, they will start imitating them and, and, and indirectly start creating those types of movements without going into the level of detail that Paul's just mentioned there. So, I was just going to say it doesn't always happen really cleanly either, does it? Or with perfect models or perfect sort of actions. Um, sometimes you, um, the most effective things may be a little bit unorthodox or just the moment of the situation demands that you just find a solution and it might be like a movement solution where you're off balance or a striker is off balance but still needs to finish or it's not always perfect is it some of, some of this um no and I, th I think what we need to recognize is the game is is played 360 degrees it's around you know there's so many variables to it there's so many variations just at various starting positions there's different there's so much so many um inconsistencies so we need to prepare everybody for everything it's never it's never like you say it's never um never the perfect perfect situation um, and we have to we have to prepare players to deal with that uh, and in very you know very quick time and I guess what what springs to my mind there is you you're talking the three of you is around I guess what you're talking about there is is you know constraints can sometimes kind of do the job for us can't they so what Paul's talking about there about the particular game and the constraints of that game you know that element of play can teach the kids some of this stuff anyway so does that graham bring in um the value of kind of varied practices in development and also maybe um, exposing kids to to different types of play and different types of games that then might bring about a wider diet of these movement skills yeah i think a couple of points on that um to start with matt is feeling feel and and sense are important in this perception as well it's not maybe just what you see when we talk about perception um sometimes you feel things before you see them um so being immersed in situations where you, it is a bit instinctive at times some some of this might be planned and prepared but sometimes it's instinctive in the moment but still based on perception but it might just be you feel a defender coming or you sense something and you take that that as well as seeing it might might dictate what you do and like affect your decision making but for those types to, to, to help become better and and we use the word attuned but just uh, be able to deal and handle the situations that come up then i guess a variety of experiences surely has got to help so you develop that that sense of feel and you can take in different pictures and you get used to checking around and seeing and taking in the information as sean said before so yeah that variety of experiences through both practice and the games program is a great way of providing the sort of stimulus that Sean's talking about in, in my view and Paul where, where might this get a little bit more serious then along the development pathway so you know where, where might you as a coach where might you start to intervene with a player and talk about movements that would really help them in terms of I guess the capabilities that they've got as a player but also helping them within games to be more effective at beating their opponent, for example? I don't think it necessarily gets more serious as you go along. I think I think you're serious about it all the way through. Um, it, it's how you how you put it, the atmosphere you put it in. You might be serious in, the, in what you want to coach, but the, the atmosphere of the of the of the session can make it more playful. It depends. It depends what you're after and depends where, where they're at. If you're happy it, when they're building new new sort of ideas concepts in a definitely an atmosphere where they feel free they feel um they they're non-threatened you know they, they it's okay to make mistakes then that gives a, a a chance for you to really 
explore like you talked about before and then you might just come in with one or two points that would help later on when they've got some of those movements right really really well honed then it would be maybe now we go into more of a competitive uh, environment and you you know when it comes down to it we, we these are all the reasons we're doing this game is to win the game to beat the opponent that's why i like the predator analogy in the end we've got to kill that opponent we've got to get past them and there's no doubt when you put competition in then the intensity will rise and then you can get that extra bit you know the the guy who's getting in front of the near post who gets his body across because they can win the match if they do it's like they get superpowers you know these these goals these goal scorers who won't make a tackle on the halfway line suddenly they get this super strength um because it's almost like superman they can they can lift the the truck off the bloody the guy who's who's been crushed because all of a sudden there's a goal to get and the intensity that comes into that movement comes really out so you you have to know the right time to build in the, the competition and and get the movements right but a, a lot of the movements that you that you want it's a it's a physical game but you you want the right techniques um to allow the right physical contact to the right time as well mm. Definitely. Do you want to take us through kind of some of the stuff that you've been looking at then, Paul, around focusing in a little bit more on um, looking at players and movements and how we might study that and, and then kind of use it to help their development? Yeah, have you got the other slides with the where, where we explain that quadrant, yeah, uh, Matt? Yeah. So, yeah, we started to use this quadrant tool it's basically just zooming in put it on the microscope and and seeing what happens and it's a way to look at what space is the defenders in or the forward how they how we might exploit those things look at what they do beforehand so they might be blind side they might be offside if he's a forward and um, might be a ball side goal side the defender and we're looking for key factors and sort of create a mental picture of what could happen now this might all depend on the, the the capabilities of the player. So if it's a if it's a tall um, a tall striker, say in the old days, uh, um, a, a Niall Quinn or or or, or um, uh, a player who's who's not so mobile, but he might make a move, but bring the ball down on his chest, pin the guy. Um, but if it's someone like a, a Marcus Rashford who might run behind the defence, then it will be different for their action sort of capabilities. So we're going to look and get a clear picture of that in our mind. In in a sense, we can't coach unless we've got some evidence to coach from. What do the top players do? What might they do in this situation? Um, you know, do they stand still and then all of a sudden make a quick dart? So we, mm. we're looking at that beforehand. And if we go to the next slide uh, on that, on that I deck... I've gone the wrong way, but I guess that's what you're putting into life, aren't you? So you're looking yeah. at... Think, yeah, I think so. We're going to try and look at that, see where, and this is very similar to you know that self space that he's got the ball in, the defenders in the in the other, and where's the free space, which yeah. would be ahead of him or maybe behind him. Yeah. Um. And and the key things that we're looking for. So, has he got a change of direction that might beat the defender? So the defender's force is moving sort of in towards him, and he maybe changes direction so that he beats that flow. Um, the change of speed, so they get him gets the defender stood still and then changes speed. And it might be disguise, he looks to turn back, his body movement may his hips may show one way, and disguising his intentions going the other. He might use his body like he is doing here as a barrier, and it might be one thing you know, you think of Rooney, Rooney or or um. Gaza years ago using their body and their arms to sort of almost batter the way through past the, the opponent and block their path to the ball. Um, so you'd be looking at all those aspects as well um, yeah. and zooming in under the microscope, yeah. And this, this player here certainly has got that change of speed, so I'm guessing he he's looking to use his body to spin and he knows he can get into that, into that open space and, and potentially create an opportunity. Yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, some of the things he's absolutely brilliant at is slowing the guy down and then bursting quickly, that change of pace, but also a change of uh, direction. Pete Sturgis, who works in the sort of, uh, particularly in the, in the 
foundation phase, he talks about a revolving door, and that's a nice analogy here. He's getting him coming into one door, but then quickly revolving out. And I would imagine his next step with his right foot would be to cross over in front of uh, Alexander Arnold, so to block his path. So you would get all that type of work going on. It's a nice way to zoom in and have a look at it. Yeah. And, and Paul, with that, you could probably just go back to that last picture quickly, Matt. Is with that you could pick that that tool up and place it over. Sorry, the, the previous one, Matt. Is um, you could then pick it up and stick it over the a couple of other players in that picture as well, couldn't you? Yeah, that's the whole idea. You zoom in and you see the spaces that are available to those players running off the ball. Then, so as you see in the far side, you're already in the quadrant. If you had it there, um, you've got you know the the attacker his blind side of the defender. So you're already seeing his movement. He's, his body orientation is sort of side on so he can see the play. He's ready to go forward and burst into the near post or or get in front of him. So you're looking at it not only on the ball, but off the ball uh, as well. Yeah. Yeah, and this, this you just then check out each point. You know, the head is what leads us. We're talking a lot here about perception, action, coupling. The action's not going to happen unless he perceives something. So where's his head looking? How does he look? Does he check on the defender? What does he notice about the defender's position, his speed he's coming at? So you've got to watch their eyes. And then you're going to work systematically because you can't see everything at once. Work down to his shoulders. What's his body orientation? Is he back to goal side on? How does he move his shoulders? How does he move his arms against the opponent? Does he knock him? Does he hold him off? Um, you know, that type of thing. Then his hip movement, his thighs, does he get that across? What's his footwork? Does he invade his space or does he stay out of his space, evading him? You know, does he invade in or, or evade? So you've got all of that worked out. Um, and you'll be watching and using this sort of as a as a tool to study what the top players do. So the likes of uh, Tevez, Aguero, Suarez, unbelievable at backing into people and using their body against them. Uh, yeah. And the top players are very, very uh, clever at getting their body in line with the ball before their opponents, like like really exactly as, um, as Sean was saying before, invading their space before the, the ball actually comes, yeah. Mm. And it's just a couple of my sketches to just say, well, it's not... It's not really just a, a quadrant on the floor. It's really a cylinder we're looking at. This was from a boxing. I was comparing it to boxing as well here, how, how you, you know, you've got your boxing fighting distance and, you know, it's the guy who stays out of the distance, but then all of a sudden can land a blow. And if we do that with football, here's one of my uh, sort of sketches saying in the same sense, we then do it phrase, frame by frame at the bottom, might be coming off a defender, but then, sitting back into him so you can see how his arms go and invade his space he might stick his backside or his back into them and um you, you'll see a lot of that type of work so it's if you think of it as a cylinder that he's they've got that space it might be jumping so if you're jumping to get to the ball first remember this uh it, it was alex Sir alex ferguson's brother martin who taught me this if you jump first in the space and get your arm above the defender, and then he jumps up. He, he can't jump above you. You know, you've jumped first, and he's basically forcing you up, and you're preventing him from getting into the space above him. Um, so, you know, it's all tiny, small tips. Andy Myers talking about it on our pro, pro license course, the Chelsea coach, ex-player, saying, well, you might be running, the guy might be quicker than you, but he's got the ball. And also, if you keep knocking his arm, knocking his arm, it's not easy to run with one arm. So it's not so much dark arts as being crafty. And uh, again, you're invading his space, the, the, the space his arm's got. Yeah. And I, th I think just on that, it, I think that, that control in that space between two players, and it might be three players, it might be four, um, but in, in essence is, is exposing and, and giving those players opportunity to train like that, to put them in those situations where they're going to have to learn how to protect the space, use the space, and that that's part of developing the strength part of the game, I guess. Um, so there's some real some real rationale to support what you're required to do in the game, and then the kind of work that you can do in order to try and prepare players for that. And and link back to what I said before, Matt, about um, exploring. I think it's really important, especially in youth development. But I think probably all the way through that, we recognise the difference in the individual 
sort of characteristics mm. and capabilities, but also tendencies where, what I mean by that is you'll have different sort of, um, it might be different size, different, um, different heights, different biomechanics. Um, they'll also have different tendencies that are, or potentially have different tendencies where some people enjoy contact more than others. Yeah. Other people prefer to drift into space. And if you flip it to defenders, that, that's similar where some defenders like to feel feel the strike and get up against them. Others like to give themselves a little bit more space. So even within that duel, if you like, as Paul's got on the screen, um, and the space is paramount, but there's, there's different ways that you can actually have success within it, depending on the on who the players are up against each other. Where if, if we're too locked into this is the only way of one model almost, if this is this is how you do it, um, that potential, especially with younger kids when they're still growing and they're still finding out what the actual physical capabilities are going to be, um, I think we just need to be a bit careful on that really. And we just help the kids explore different ways of doing it. Yeah, I think that's vital. And the work I've been doing recently on 1v1 tactics, going into different clubs, has really brought this out. So when you speak to experienced people who've been maybe top players, so at Spurs recently, I was talking about maybe you'd back in here. And Ryan Mason, who'd uh, you know who's had to retire through injury, he was there was one of the coaches. Well, I, I just couldn't do that. I wasn't a strong enough player to back in in that way. So I would get myself side on and take the ball away from them. Uh, so that would be one example. Another was Nigel Gibbs, who'd played so many games for Watford in the in the Premier League or the, in the first division. He said, "Well, I knew I was five foot six, I had quick feet, but if someone got in a real race with me over Mars, if he had ten yards space." I was dead, so I had to mark him closer. I had to get to him quicker and almost smother him before he got started. So these are all the, I'm saying the predator tactics that you've got to, you've got to be the coach that allows the kids to experiment. And if they're failing, you've got to then ask them the right questions or point them to, um, you know, the solution. How hell, how else could you do it? What are you good at? And he's maybe not so good at. And and that's the thing, you know, working against your opponent, your direct opponent, you've got to suss it out quickly. And in that sense, part of your strategy at the part at the front part of the game is to test him out. So part of the test at the start of the game, I remember a really good coach called uh, Walter Joyce, whose who's son Warren was a coach at Man United for years. Walter used to say, test his courage, test his speed, test his running power. Test all of those out in the first 10 minutes. Do you want to keep running with me? Do you keep want to keep doing it? Do you want to get physical with me? Do you, you know how quick are you? So they're all tests that you want to sort of get a feel for at the beginning of the game. It's a bit like the start of a boxing match. We'll just feel each other out here and I'll see what you like. Mm. And then well, let's get the fight on sort of thing. Not the fight, but the, the cunning battle, the cunning duel, because, um, a part of that, a big part of that, will be the skills in which you do it. You know, yeah, I think that links to the decision making as well oh. because that sort of has happened to different layers, doesn't it? So you've got like the team tactical decision making, but you've also got them little mini decisions, if you like, within those little moments of am I going to pin or am I going to uh, find a different position or decide oh. to take up your position to try and not just for your preference, but because you know they don't like it. Or it's uncomfortable for them. So all those little, uh, as you say, cunning little cunning battles, like little game within a game, real, isn't it? Yeah, um, yeah. And and I think just to add, to probably get to reinforce what <clears throat> the point's been made is that giving players a range of experiences to see what they are capable and not capable of doing, um, and then giving them a chance to learn about themselves, and then also the ability to learn about other people. But then also from the coach's point of view, is asking questions from the players to to to, to check their understanding to see whether they recognise what they would do in these particular situations because there's, there's often times people will want to sort of almost sort of drive it, tell them rather than sort of actually trying to understand before trying to provide advice and support. Yeah. That, that, that point from the physical point of view is really important as well. Where you're talking about sussing, sussing your report out early in the game and working out what you might, what tools you might have to get out of the toolbox today to play against them. Um, I guess as well as giving kids a variety of, um, experiences so that they can practice with a lot more of those tools. It's also, you know, whatever their super strength is, what are you going to rely on most? Oh. So if you've got really explosive power like a Sterling, for example, 
and you can get away from and change speed very quickly and you can get away from people well what can we do <clears throat> not only exposing stuff within game and training based scenarios but how can we also help your um help your body to make sure that you're even more explosive and you're even more quicker and you can you can use those yeah. explosive things more and more so you can up the intensity of play against your opponent and that sort of thing yeah and i think matt well that's that's a balance that everybody's got to really think about because while you're spending three afternoons in the gym you're not getting the, the opportunity to learn the techniques and the feel and the perception of, of of these things and i'm thinking about people like modric um uh messi um what's he called uh silver david silver and all these well there's loads of them aren't there iniesta and so on they well they don't look like they've ever been in the gym in their life but they're unbelievable oh. at enticing people using the the force of the defender the size the speed of the defender against him to entice him in, to commit him, to play one way, go the other way. Now, I'm not saying at any point that, of course, the gym work's important, but it has to be then channeled to functional work whereby they can use that uh, strength uh, against their opponents. Um, and, and that, it is a lot of technique. I think this is a massive opportunity now. And traditionally in this country, for years, we were very strong on tackling. We were very strong on the physical side of the game, being tough. Um, sliding in, you were allowed to put six studs up and, and, and put your foot up. And it, that's just going out of the game now, whether people like it or not. That th those The interpretation of the rules is coming more to a European, worldwide interpretation. And in that sense, then you have to adapt. And the way you adapt is to use your body better to protect the ball and use your body against the opponent, um, as we see a lot of the really top players doing. Again, Aguero, Suarez, Tevez, people like that are incredible at using their body. They're not the biggest guys, um, but they, they really know almost like it's martial half martial arts. They know how to use their body. In fact, I like, me to a, a bit this week talking to the Spurs um, fitness uh, coach, Carl Halibay. Um, he was talking about experience of martial arts and how they – how they are able to tense their body in contact mm -hmm. and how the breathing is part of that. The fum fum, you know, is part of the tension, but the breathing and, and the tension in your body that you have to have just before you receive it to hit the opponent with your body to be tense, but then to receive the ball and relax your body, you have to cushion it. So there's a, a tension and a cushion that you have to be really, well, you've got to practice that. And that's why also you, you can't really do this in dummy drills and or just 1v1 practice. You know, it has to be done full out because yeah. there has to be the tension of the competition, you know? Absolutely. And, I, I think, and that's a really important point to make, isn't it? You know, the physical corner isn't all just about putting them in the gym and doing it. You know, there's a large part of the physical corner that is around movement efficiency and movement quality. Um, and, and also understanding how you can use your body and you can only learn to do that and become a master of that if you get chance to practice and rehearse it so you've got to get the time on the grass but I, I, the two go hand in hand for me if you if you if you swing too far one end and do everything here and nothing here, you're probably missing out a little bit and if you do too much at the other end you're missing out on the skill development stuff so i think yeah, you've, yeah. Got to get, you've got to get little bits of it in because the stronger you are, the more you can practice because you can stay out on the grass for longer as well. Another point just on just on that, Matt, is the experience I've had um, at Manchester United for a number of years was that we mixed age groups. Now, then, these are just like skill concepts for other parts of, of the game, but the older players can teach the younger players. Yeah. Now, in my experience, the, the, the older ones didn't, overdo the physical part they didn't smash kids and so on but just by being in the game they were a privileged spectator to see how the older ones use their body how they how the speed and intensity they used it at at the right moment how they roll someone or so on and how they could um the, the dyna dynamic working in in a in that area we used to play uh 
well, so it would be very compact. So in, in, in quite a quite a big cage, you used to play 13 a side, or we used to mix the age groups as well. And we obviously told the older ones, you not, you know, you can't be too physical with the young ones. Um, and they weren't, they were like big brothers for them. But the, the learning they got from being so close to people who had that physical capability, but also the technique of, say, backing in or a proper shoulder charge or, or so on, um, you know, it's all very well saying, well, watch the older ones. But when you're actually two yards away, it yeah. has a bigger effect. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think back when I was um, when I was at Fulham, I um, we had Musa Derelli before he went across to um, went across to Tottenham, and his ability to use his body and his his strength and his power is just in, incredible in mm. terms of protecting the protecting the ball, getting away from players, and just his ability to almost look as though he's out of it, and then he gets himself back in and uses his body was just it was just um, incredible to see, and then obviously he carried that through to to playing at Tottenham. Graham, um, you were going to make a point before. Sorry. Yeah, it was just about some of the like simple, probably unnoticed or potentially unnoticed skills, if you like, around like midfielders pushing off their opponent to get a yard. So even off throwing, so whatever, where you just it's that little time and get the timing right. If your balance is right, it yeah. buys it buys you two seconds. So you might think so it is around the decision and the timing, but it might be around the physical bit of get. You get the timing right of the push off, so you put the put your opponent off balance, and it just buys you that extra time to turn out. Or and that might be in, in general play, right. or the, the bits of skill of being able to receive the ball under pressure and absorb the pressure um, in a way that you protect the ball, but your body's still soft enough to have a really good touch. Yeah. Is that the combination of um, strength to absorb the pressure, but so, like softness in your body to? Put the ball in and take the ball where you want it. Um, yeah. that, it's that, like all those, all those the skills of which you need kids to really like keep getting better and keep refining all the way through the ages. I guess it, just from the practice, you look at you look at some of look at sports like uh, like springboard diving, for example. I don't know why that's jumped into my mind, but it's a, when you said about time in there, you know, those guys are, are, are clearly powerful athletes, but. What they also do really well through massive amounts of rehearsal is that they time when they hit the board so that it they get the maximum use of the equipment and the board springs them up in the air and then they get more time and that, and that's the same for our players, isn't it? We've got to fit, got to put them in situations where they get lots of practice at getting that timing right to be able to then give themselves more time against their opponent, like you've just described there. I think I think just to just to finish off on that is that. The thing that comes to mind when you keep talking about it, it's just experience. You see it in the older players, the players that have been around the game for a while. Is that they start to learn? They 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 they're, they're one step ahead because they're 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 picking up the right things at the right time, and then able able to move themselves in the right in the right places. Um, and uh, funny enough, I just came across a quote that that Johan Cruyff used, and I used it in some of the presentations I've done for you, Matt. Is uh, where he says speed is often confused with insight. When I start running earlier than others, I appear faster. So it's again talking about that experience of picking up the right, the right information, and then, and then being able to get to where he needs to get to. Um, Absolutely. Do you want to take us through this bit then? Sure. Yeah. So, so yeah. this came about again. It was it was working with a with, with a, um, a friend of mine, Mike Critchell, around sort of looking at the game in a slightly different way. Whereas obviously coming from predominantly well a very strong co coaching background, then looking at it from uh, in particular the key movements, and then looking at it. From uh, so as the game was building up, especially in the final third, is is the cluster of players you're getting around people, especially with the ball, and then it becomes more paramount when you look at um, um, all coming in from wide areas about you know, the, the clusters you get within the area and, and from set plays and so forth. But in particular, with the two uh, visuals you've got on the screen now, is just that uh, is this recognizing this five, five meter mayhem, and it will be it might be in these two instances where the player on the ball has got three or four players in around him. And they've got to try and overcome that problem that's in placed in front of them, um, maybe off balance, maybe under a bit of pressure, using the body and so forth. And then thinking about it, OK, well, how do we then apply this to our sessions? Is it something that we can start integrating? And it might be that, you know, you might have players already in there and you're operating within that area. You might be you have players coming in from different directions to engage with the area, which is what happens in the game, because... When you look at it across uh, across a wider <coughs> picture, you'll find that these five meter mayhem's overlap everywhere. Um, so you're not getting the player always coming from from one direction; they're coming from all directions, and they're coming from different speeds. And you're travelling at different speeds, and you've got different things in front of you, and you're you're in around the goal area. Um, 
and again it could be it can be it can be as it is on the ground or it can be high up in the air um when you're competing for a ball it could be without the ball so you're trying to lose a player but then you've got to integrate you're going to sorry you're going to come across through that contextual interference other players in your team or or the opposition so it's just exposing people into a variety of different ways within this sort of five meter mayhem which is what we recognize happens especially in around the penalty box I guess yeah I think that, that's um, right Matt. um you know, you've got to think about practices where this will happen. We're, we're quite often after equal numbers and we're after some perfect sort of session, but it's not always perfect. It's sometimes very messy. Um, one way, well, a few ways we used to do this uh, at, at Man United every Monday, even with the older players, the under 18s, but with, with younger players mixed in, a guy called Jim Ryan, who was the director of youth for years, we did a session where it was mainly on combinations. So we would have an overload of, say, 12v8 or 10v6 or whatever it, the number was and they would the, the team who was attacking would try and flow through with combinations one twos and so on it was very successful um, but a big part of it as well was the, the incentive for the people defending was if they won it they had to dribble so anybody coming across would see this and it looked completely it wouldn't look like football it looked like like chaos like uh, playing in the playground really because you'd have one guy trying to beat 12 people and of course well we even had Gary Neville come over and he said well, this isn't possession they need to spread out you know this isn't possession at all and we said well no Gary this is not possession it's a series of moments where he's trying to beat this guy he's trying to go between these two and once he's got past these two actually another one pops up and it's another moment he's trying to beat him and I can I can tell you some of the dribbles we had were unbelievable and of course, I had some good players in there. You had Paul Bogber in, and you had Tianazai, and you had some people. But the, that then, it's like, well, that's not going to happen in a match. Well, no, but you might have three in front of you in the penalty area. Mm. As soon as you've beaten that three in this practice, another three appear because the 12 of them, and then another three behind them, and the three behind them. So it's a great overload, and, and pretty much what the chaos you used to get in the playground. Uh, where you'd all have the same colour kits, uh, not kits on, but uniforms on, and there's five different games going on, and you've got to try and sort all that perception out and and the physical side of it to stop, slow down, beat the guy. Um, so that was that's a way you can do it uh, within within your sessions. And I suppose the other way I, I always go back to is my childhood game where I fell in love with football was Wembley singles, where, of course, at first you would stand by the goalie and, tap everything in at the far post when people shot but when it came to the last few rounds and it's the really good players now it's one against four the other three good players in now it's i've got to beat all four of them or now three of them and funnily enough people would say oh well, that's not fair if you get knocked out in the in the early round but well, that's the other part of it you never wanted to get knocked out and you were so desperate to stay in that that fueled the physical the physicality to beat them as well that competition I, th I think I think an important thing is is is, um, is to start sort of noticing what is it that people do well and why is it so why why is it that people are successful in these situations and what is it they're doing well because then that's and you almost become an obsessive observer about looking at these kind of things whether it be a one v one or be a two v one overload or it be off the ball situation or whatever is what is it they're doing that that, that makes them successful in these situations uh, and then then and then again based on what's happening in the game, you can then be creative with the type of sessions you challenge your players with uh, and the constraints you put within it to, to try and get them uh, to become the best they can. Well, have you got an example from 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 your kind of experiences as well, Sean, about how, how do you expose players to getting really, really efficient and agile and, and, and quick and quick thinking in, in these situations? Well, I suppose I suppose you, you we we would ordinarily manipulate the environment, the, the area. Um, as soon as you give more space, people get more time. They're able to manage it manage it more. Um, you reduce the space. You reduce the, 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 what the space looks like. You then obviously challenge people and 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 again manage the manage the numbers in appropriate ways to try and increase the um, the demand um, that's placed in the players that they've got to they've got to take in. And it's just it's just finding those levels of how you continually challenge them. Um, and like I said, there's a lot of work done within this this five meter mayhem. I'm not saying you do you do it all the time. It's, it's small snippets of work, but that could be a one v one. It could be a two v one within that particular 
just keep possession of the ball. It could be a possession where you're 3v2 in that tight area. It could yeah. be where players start outside the area and then come into the area. There's loads of – you can have fun with it, really. You can just do a whole host of different things and um, and sort of give people objectives that want to work towards. And then, you know, the, the most important thing is to, can you can you link it to what you're trying to do within the game, which is to score and stop goals, is how do you tie it into there? And there's loads of different ways of doing that because ultimately we want an end point from it. We want someone to be able to finish and score a goal. So, um, so yeah, there's a whole host of different things. And, again – if you've got a team of people that you work with, it, you know, this can be where very much where you and your fitness coaches work together to try and achieve these sort of outcomes. Absolutely. I think yeah, an important point with it is the, the best players always have that sense of calm in the chaos, or seem to from the outside, um, where they seem like the calmest, calmest person in that mayhem. Um, so that's something to really consider. And often where the, there's a messy picture and, and it's not clean and it's not what they've seen before, but they can sort of make sense of it. And the, the the pick up reference points and they're not clean but they sort of just know where they are so you hear about strikers they know where the goal is and they don't need to look and and it might be they might be off balance and um come up with a new technique they might use a different part of the foot or, to get a shot off it's just like that adaptability in the moment um and having that sense of like this, this you can still operate still think and, and adapt but that comes from a variety of experiences i think I think just at John's point as well, adding variety, not even just things like where the ball starts in a practice where it doesn't always start from the same point. Or, so you're not quite sure where it's coming from and it's not quite as all set up perfect as as you'd like because often in the box it might not be like that or around the box. So it's just around, as I think Sean said as well, it wouldn't be that everything needs to be like that within the diet of your, of your work. Yeah. And what, what Paul described as well from his practices in the past is it's almost the train hard, fight easy analogy isn't it so if you've got to try and beat 12 players in training when you've got to try and beat three in a match that's kind of actually your body's adapted to kind of a higher stimulus than that so by doing that type of training what you're doing is you you know you, you're developing yes those the determination the decision making but also the speed of movement of beating three and then having to try and beat another one well you might not do that in a game but your body's now adapted to being able to do that and also, you might be able to do that more often if you practice it more often because your body, again, you know, the energy systems that, that pro provide energy for those explosive actions are being developed from the training that you're doing. So all the time, the physical corner is linking directly into these technical things that you're going after as well. So I think one, yeah. one thing – oh, sorry, Paul, Karen. Yeah, no, no, the, the only point I was going to make was – yeah, you, you you might put a lot of sessions on where it's going to happen, but you've also got in your, having your mind um, some coaching points for common things that come up, you know. Um, and and in doing that, I think you're looking at the, yeah, change the speed, change the direction, disguise the timing, using the body as a barrier. These are all the common tactics. Um, and then you're looking at very much the the sense of flow. How do you flow with your body? And can you get the other guy flowing maybe at your speed or quicker and then stop that flow to disrupt him and then go the other way? So you might be – then the timing of that's important because if you do it too soon, he clobbers you. But if you get him just to your shoulder before you make that turn, now he goes sailing past and then you go away. So these are some of the little coaching points. You can say, well, look, you you, you really need to – you need to be a bit braver and, and like – it's a great – uh, quote that Michael um, Carrick's been using is, you know, you have to get close, closer to the fire without getting burnt. So you have to go that little bit further and just test it out and then do it, then make the little turn so you sell the dummy completely. So there's, there's that type of thing that you can bring in as part of the coaching. And in that sense, what you're doing as a coach, you're looking at the forces. Can we get him really running fast that way? If I stop, his force takes him on. Now we've got him unbalanced. And we can go the other way. So a lot of it is to do with stability, like um, Sean was talking about before. You Are you stable inside your boundaries? Do you get outside your boundary now to, to, to get him off balance and now go the other way? And then it's explosive. So now is the force quick to get away from him. So you're looking at all the time flow, disrupting his flow, um, balance, getting him unbalanced, um, using the body as a barrier, you know, and how do you force that bang and get across his line of, you know, uh, of getting across his line? So all those would come into some little coaching points that you would save up. A lot of this time, this stuff's done in the instance. 
So you're not going to stop the practice then and stop the enjoyment, but you might pull him afterwards and in a little break and say, well, why don't you use your body a bit more when and be physical and then you'll get the turn? Or why don't you try and entice him a little bit more into the space and get him moving more before you make your dodge? So then you've got those little tips for them just in the, the, the minute break and then you let them get back into the action, you know? And Paul, yeah. just with that around, um, I think you can sort of, point the player's attention to some of the sort of triggers that might help them. Yeah. And like helping them understand when. So if it is around movement, like when when do you move? So some of the little key little um, different types of triggers. But even like if a winger is going to cross it, what's the trigger to start your run? Um, again, like simple things which coaches talk about. But players can recognise those triggers. It helps them prepare that little moment. Um, prepare and use the body ready. Because ready. some of those triggers aren't always clean, but players can start picking them out it can help them in that moment with the decision making absolutely just make one make one point back just quickly there's a good good point on that and because i think i think there's 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 opportunities for players to really sort of watch themselves back in that kind of detail to recognize what is it that 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 you know why did i get success or why did i not get success and they'll start to pick up those small little bits of piece of information it might be for example the distances that i started or it might be my starting position and that may be based on what they saw or what they didn't see and so therefore if they can start to recognize that that then enables them to start to put it in practice themselves without always relying on the coaches to sort of pick it out all the time for them so there's that opportunity to sort of help reflect on through that experiential learning to help them reflect on what they're doing through um, through some sort of analysis of some sort absolutely and i won't dwell too much on this slide this is just a, a, a a continuum that we talk about across some of our uh, FA professional game courses. And I guess it's just to highlight that the the stuff that we've been talking about today really focuses on developing the players and working with the players around the right-hand side of this model, you know, thinking about the realism and the, the chaotic nature of the game and getting lots of practice, variety and experience at those in-game specific mo movements linked to decision making to help make the player become really, really um, e expert and efficient in the movements that they use. So when they do use the decisions in terms of trying to beat their opponent or disguise and then move or tip the player off balance, they practice that and their body is stable, it's, it's, it's balanced, it's coordinated in those movements to be able to do that one, so that they get more success, and two, so that it doesn't cost as much energy when they do that stuff. It's worth kind of re-emphasizing for me that if you get a little bit of the, the left-hand side stuff as well around the isolated stuff, that can allow you more time to practice, more time to play in games, because you're, you're kind of helping the, helping the player's body prepare for that. But the really important bit about being these clever players who are really agile and who can work in those tight areas of space and those really critical areas of the field is they've got to get loads of practice on the right hand side of that model. So, so this was just something put together um, just to sort of give a frame of reference really. And I think it's, it was originally put together sort of the build up to when you go through that sort of uh, physical changes through that, 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 um, that period of, sort of adolescence and it's just um really i suppose it's uh it's identifying that we you know to the point of what we want to achieve in the long term is what do we have we, what do we need to have in place in the um in the sort of uh in in the in the immediate time in terms of what do we need to ingrain at the young age to then build up but again there'll be some of this stuff that carries through to some of the older age group players by, by for definite but i think just looking at the first the the first box it talks about you know developing that fundamental way of traveling. We've got different ways of traveling. We're walking, we're jog, uh, running, we're, we're skipping, we're hopping, we're, we're jumping, we're, we're crawling, we're sliding and sliding by that uh, sort of means sort of like a jockeying type of movement. Um, and it's making sure that we, 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 that the players are able to do that in an effective way, but also be being able to do it in the four areas of space that I made reference to earlier on. And then we recognize actually we do it in various directions, different rhythms, different heights, different speeds. So it's not just in one direction. It's not just at one speed. It's not one rhythm. It's not just a single height. There's loads of varieties and variations that we need to do it. 
And through that, we develop balance and coordination. Uh, and especially with the younger players, you can do a lot of work around stories and imagery to get them to imitate the kind of things. And it might be animals. It might. And this is very young age groups. It might be animals. It might be reference to players. It might be little scenarios where they're not thinking about the movement. They're just thinking about the person they're or the thing they're trying to represent. And that will install the type of movements that you need. Um, and then, and then as we threw, is, is it, how do we then combine these movements? Because if we look at all good players, and we talked about it earlier on about how they might flow, and there's that seamless transition from one movement to the next. Is if you're going forward and you suddenly got to go backwards, it's that bit in between where you're able to to to, to transition from one movement to the second movement. So then you expose the players to various combinations. So it might be you, you, you're going, you're hopping, you're hop, you're hopping forwards, and then you're you're skipping sideways, and then you're running backwards. And there's a and, and then you can challenge them to do it at different heights. And then they start to understand shapes and distances and angles. And then you just challenge them in those kind of situations. And then it becomes an important point where once we started in, in installing that and we started developing that, we can then continually to build and, and build onto these types of movements. Um, you know, de developing things like speed and that. Let's do it in a fun way where it's competitive because if you just turn around to someone to get from A to B as quick as they can, they won't do it as quick as they if they would do if they were doing a competitive relay race or, or, or a fun situation. But then as we as we develop, it's important that there is an element of, you know, of key teaching. And that's around acceleration, deceleration, changing direction, because if people don't like if people aren't able to to to, to perform those efficiently, then then there are problems because then you can start leading to injuries and so forth with a combination of other stuff. It's not just that in isolation. And then you're walking across, obviously, the three planes of movements, adding in that functional strength about how we how we use our body against opponents. And then, and then, and then challenge them through that sort of contextual interference within that chaos training, and there's, and, and this is just sort of a, a, a sort of a, a few points to add in there. But there'll be hundreds of different things that come from it. But we need to sort of establish these as sort of uh, fundamentals to have in place because going forward, when we start to go through that growth spur, what's going to happen? The bodies are going to change, and instead of just throwing a whole new 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 batch of things onto people, we need to revisit the stuff they would have done beforehand. Um, but still challenge them cognitively. So still challenge them with their, you know, with with the with the information they're trying to take in, but reinforcing those 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 movements that they would have developed at a young age. So, mm -hmm. and and then making sure there's a clear attachment throughout the whole pathway mm -hmm. for the players. And we can't just assume that players have these, you know, uh, particularly in modern society. So they might be good players, but they still might be limited in some of these movement qualities. So. Even though there's some kind of reference ages on there, I would suggest that we need to keep on challenging and checking the players yeah. are competent with these all the way through there. Even even with senior players, we, we can go back to some of these things and 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 help them to you know to really develop these movement qualities so that when they need to express them in the game on the back of a decision, they've got it in the locker to be able to do it. Yeah, Graham, absolutely. Graham, is there anything from you on that? I think just around from coaches, um, is around noticing what how the kids are getting on and, and where the kids are at, um, and paying attention that to to where they're at on their journey, especially thinking about off the back of uh, growth spurts or um, at any age really, um, not being too set of their their thirteen, so they should be doing this, or their fifteen, so they should be doing that. Um, just like noticing them without even um, Something's been too hard. Just noticing how the kids are doing, and then almost like I said before, helping the kids then explore whether it's about relearning, um, code like almost re, re coordinating themselves, mm -hmm. or whether it's just explore now the body's changed, they're not be capable of some new things. So like, how do we help them make the most of that? Um, which might sound a little bit vague or a little bit fluffy, but I, I think it's really important we're nurturing kids at that that age through this. Um, and, and also help me understand how this links. How does this help you become better on the field? Yeah. Um, and how, how, do we, say, how do we need the staff around us to help that? Go on, Sean. No, I was going to say, I think the key thing is, that, you know, when, when we're talking at the top level, we're talking about complex situations. We're talking about people problem solving uh, without having to consciously think about the movement. And we need to give people a baseline of, of uh, you know, that of development to then build on top of it as we go through, through the range of experiences. Obviously, if people don't have, it's like it's like trying to build a house and having no foundations, isn't it? You don't build a house on nothing, so you've got to be, embed those foundations to then build on. And various people will go in different ways, but we need to make sure we do that. Um, so, so that's key. And I think just going back to your point quickly there about how do you integrate other staff is, 
this you know i know from having gone from a coaching for 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 a good number of years to then having experience of working as a fitness coach going back into coaching you recognize actually what you do as a coach is very very heavily influenced by by um by what um by, by what the fitness coach does and vice versa so therefore we need to make sure that we work in uh work together on this and and to make sure that we're both noticing and 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 they can add value like we can add value to to what they're doing and, and we can both um sort of hopefully support one another brilliant sean thank you paul thank you graham thank you we've covered a lot of ground hopefully you found some of that useful and uh, hopefully we'll see you on another webinar in the future